Are you ready to take your oil painting skills to the next level by adding originality to your paintings? Well then look no further. In this comprehensive tutorial, I show you how to bring unique character to your artwork by painting one of three distinct noses in oil. You will learn the art of capturing individuality and character through observation. Step by step, I will show you how to take your reference photos into digital software, overlay them with a grid for accuracy, then draw it on canvas, then refine that drawing to make it better, and then bring your vision to life with a two-step oil painting process. So this video is literally packed with over four hours of step-by-step -step instruction, and that's just for the first nose painting. But I take this tutorial to the next level with the other two noses. And if you want to take advantage of that, you see the link in the description below for the ultimate nose tutorial. So say goodbye to generic paintings and hello to stunning one of a kind works of art that truly capture the essence of your subjects. So grab your brushes, grab your paints, grab your reference images, and join me on this journey to improve your oil painting skills and breathe life and individuality into your paintings. So let's get started. Okay, here we are in the nose tutorial. Welcome to the nose tutorial. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out in digital because most of what you'll find today, especially in the digital world, is you'll get most of your references digitally. And I'm going to show you how to get, you know, places to get free references, uh, really good light, lit references with good lighting on them. And then I'm going to show you how to cut those references up in a free program called Krita. This is K, it's K-R-I-T-A. I'll put the link in the show notes or in the description. And um, you can use this free program or free software to bring multiple images together. Uh, for this example, it's just going to be, you know, three separate noses that I'm doing. But you could also create your whole kind of uh, a creation of background and foreground and figure and things like that within Krita as well. You can work up your composition here, all from photography, and then prepare it for your painting by throwing a grid on top of it. So before I get into how to set up all of those reference images in a good format and ready for your painting, let's talk about where you can get some of uh, some free photography that's really good. Uh, Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S dot com. You can search for nose <laughs> and uh, lots of noses, especially puppy noses and squirrel noses. All kinds of noses will come up, like a pig nose there. And you get a wonderful diversity of individuals here. And that's what we're going to focus on within this news tutorial is the ability to uh, observe, regardless of the nose shape or the lighting, what's happening with the nose. Through observation, you'll be able to build life and individuality into your painting through this. So that's one place, Pexels. The other place is unsplash unsplash.com let's do a search for nose here lots of really good photography here as well you'll see all kinds of noses these are both free uh, to download always want to kind of give a shout out to the uh, photographer that you're pulling images from and making some adjustments to also i like new masters academy new masters academy it is a subscription based um course they have actually a ton of courses on here but what they also do is they have uh, a bunch of reference images uh, like thousands and thousands of reference images so if you want courses and things like that uh, they can help you out there as well as all the references reference images it is quite expensive uh, per year but they offer a lot there the other thing that's uh, that you do have to pay for but it's less expensive it's very reasonable in pricing uh, is uh, artstation.com you here i'm in the the shop area and i'm on resources and you can see we have all kinds of figurative resources a lot of these are blurred out because there is a lot of nudity here unfortunately uh, because we're looking at a lot of figures things like that 
But as you can see, most of these prices are inexpensive, nine, 10, $12, and they have a lot of sales all the time. Most of my reference images packs, like, you know, you get a thousand different photo photographs of uh, this uh, figure posing, this model posing for $12 or less, depending on the sale. It's really good. Another one I like is Rachel Bradley. It's uh, imrachelbradley.com. She has some wonderful reference images. You can see a lot of digital artists use uh, a lot of her work. She has a gum road where you can buy her work. So there's some places where you can get your reference images. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to rework this entire image from start to finish so that you get an understanding of how to pull your images, your reference images, whatever images you choose, into Krita and then add a grid to those. First thing I'm gonna do is hit Control N on my keyboard, or you can go up to the top and go File, New. It's also Control N, Command N. And depending on what canvas you're gonna work on uh, when you're creating a new document, you'll be up here, custom document, right? And you can change it to inches or millimeters, centimeters, whatever you use, whatever country. 150 uh, resolution is, is gonna be great for this. And we are working on an eight by 10 canvas. So eight inches by 10 inches. And then I'm going to create. Now I have my Krita set up so that the background is going to be this nice gray, this nice neutral gray. But if you don't have that, it's really easy to add. You would just hit insert on your keyboard for a new layer. And then you can pick the fill tool, which is right here. This is like the bucket tool. You can hit F for it. And then whatever color picker you have up here, you wanna select kind of a mid gray. Okay, and then we'll just fill that entire layer. It's a little bit darker on this one, but that's fine. It's, it's closer to what we had before, this previous nose tutorial uh, that I'm, I'm gonna show you how to build. Now that we have our base canvas, let's open up our images that we've already downloaded. So I'm gonna hit Control O, or you can go up to the file menu and choose open. And here's the three images that I chose. One, two, three, I can select all three and hit open. Those will open up in new tabs. There you go. And whether you have a stylus or a, or a mouse, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna be using a stylus because I have a pen tablet. Makes it a little bit easier to draw on here. Uh, but you can do the same thing I'm doing with a mouse. I've did that for years before I, I even got a pen display. So this can be achieved with a mouse, no problem. So let's start with our front view nose. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this selection tool. It's S on your keyboard, it's a freehand selection tool. And by the way, your tools could be um, in many different places uh, within Krita. It has multiple different layouts you can, you can use, uh, but I'll be using just basic tools for this. You'll be able to see the tools right away uh, when you open up Krita for the first time. And I'm gonna select pretty much the entire middle of this person's head and then control C on my keyboard. And then I'm gonna go back to the tab of the new document we created and control V. Now, as you can see, it created a new layer up at the top left up here, but I don't see it on my keyboard or on, on my canvas. And that's because the image that we pulled from is really large and it's somewhere in this blank space where we can't see it. So if I go, if I, uh, put my cursor over the the thumbnail image and I can actually make this larger so you can see so that thumbnail image like right over the image and I, I hit control or hold control and tap it you can see that my selection appears here this is um, me selecting that image and then I can move it I can actually uh, this is the move tool here so for T and then I can move it around, move that image around. And then we're gonna do the same for the other two. So I'm gonna to go to my profile view, hit S for my, my freehand selection tool, and I'm gonna select a large portion of this person's face. Control C, Control V, V is in Victor. And then that one, 
wasn't too far off the canvas, so we'll position it there. Sorry, it's really small, so I can see the rest of um, everything where it appears. And this absolutely beautiful portrait here, I'm going to select a large portion of their face. Control C as in cat, Control V as in Victor, and then my move tool. I'll move that portrait into position. So what I would like to do is have the bottom nose on top. So as far as layers are concerned, I can select that layer over here and then hit this up arrow and it'll go above and you can see it there. Now, what we need to do is uh, zoom in. You can hit two on your keyboard and that will give you the full zoom. You can see everything all at once. And we need to change some sizes here so that uh, we can fit things on, on the canvas. <clears throat> so I'm going to select uh, our first nose or front view nose, and I'm going to hit uh, actually, I'm going to I'm going to go to this tool here. So this is the transform a layer or selection tool or control T. And if I zoom out again, because that image is so huge, look how big that image is. Uh, you can see this bounding box appears. Now, if if I start moving this, what's going to happen is it's it's going to um, warp the image, and we don't want that. What you want to do is you want to hold Shift while you're dragging one of these boxes around and changing the size. So make sure you hold Shift. That will keep the ratio of the nose where it's supposed to be. I'm also going to rotate it. So you go out here to one of the corners and you can rotate this, this person so that they're uh, vertical. And this is not going to look exactly what I had before, but I'm going to try and get it as close as I can. So there we go. I changed the size and moved uh, that nose around so it's in a good space. Let's uh, check out our next layer, our move tool. We'll go to our move tool and then we'll put this nose over here. And I'm just focusing on the noses. Yes, I'm covering up uh, some of our other images and that's okay. And I'll probably end up cutting some of that out and I'll show you that next. So there's our noses placed. And what I want to do is I want to go to uh, this image on the right and I'm going to go back to my freehand selection tool and I'm going to remove some of that image. So I'm only on this layer. So what I can do is I can do a selection like this and then hit delete on my keyboard. And because I'm only on that layer, it's going to delete only what's what's there. Let's do the same for this. Uh, the bottom photograph. There we go. And that's all we need. Our three reference images only took a few minutes for me to get these in here and to uh, get things set up. So no problem. Now, the next thing we're going to do, which is a lot of fun, is we're going to add a grid to this canvas. And Crit is really great for that because you can go up here to settings and you can go to these things called dockers. Okay. And they got a ton of them. And there's a wonderful one called grids and guides. Okay. And what we're going to do <clears throat> is because this is in inches, uh, we're going to do two inches across and two inches up and down so that we have two inch squares all over our eight by 10 canvas. And what I need to do is I need to change my settings. So this shows inches instead of pixels. So what you can do is you can right click on the rulers and then you choose inches and now it'll show inches there. Now our, our grids, if I uh, come over here to the Docker that we opened up, and I can even drag this docker down and make it a bit smaller so that we can see it out here. I can check this show grid box 
And as you can see, it's showing a 20 pixel by 20 pixel grid. And we don't need that. We don't need um, all of those. And it's a type rectangle. And we don't want two subdivisions. We want just one subdivision, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, this will stay locked so that it stays in squares. And I'm just going to put my cursor in the X spacing and then hold down the up key on my keyboard until I get four squares across. Only four squares showing one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. So that would be if we divide eight inches by two, there's going to be four across and 10 inches by two, there's going to be five vertically. So that works out perfectly. And I'll keep hitting up on my keyboard now slowly until this last line over here at the right, this last line over here at the right. Oops, I accidentally hit the key 297. Uh, this last line over here at the right goes all the way to the edge. So at 297, 298, 299, look at that, 300. So 300 worked out perfectly. And now I have these wonderful lines to show me where my grid should show, okay? Now, the next thing I'm going to do is hit insert on my keyboard. And what you see over here is we have a new layer inserted. Then I'm going to pick like a red color. So red and then very bright red. And uh, Krita comes with all these awesome brushes. And I like this brush here because it's very flat and we can make it a little bit larger. And then we have this nice red mark we can make, okay? If you make any mark that you don't like, just control Z or command Z if you're on a Mac and you can change it. So I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. There we go. And you can use an awesome line tool. So this is the line tool here and we're just gonna draw some lines. So I'm gonna position my cursor right here and then um, I'm gonna tap down and then pull it down this way. And you can hold shift and it will snap vertically and then let go, and now we got a red line. Do the same thing here, hold shift, it will snap vertically. Same thing here, snap vertically. And we can do the same thing horizontally. We're gonna get these lines as close to the grid as we possibly can, and it all depends on how, you know, where you start the line. Because if you start it in the right place and you hold shift, it will end up in the right place as well. Okay. Now we can turn off our grids and guides. We'll hit the, we'll uncheck the show grid button. We can close up this docker. And now we have a nice grid over our noses, over our reference. And what I like to do is because it's, it's so bright, it's really hard to see a lot of things. I will go up here to opacity at the top left. This is part of the layers docker. And I'll take it down to like maybe 30%, somewhere around there. Yeah, even 25%. And you can just barely see those lines, just enough so that we, you can get an understanding <clears throat> of you know, where the nose lies. Now, depending on your level, your comfort level with grids, and this is what I would always suggest, is instead of starting out with really tiny grids, Let's, let me make a new layer so I can illustrate this better. So instead of gridding out your canvas with, you know, these really tiny grids all over the place, let's say if I, instead of two inches by two inches, I had, you know, quarter inch by quarter inch or one inch by one inch. Now it's, it's good to start out like this if you are not, if you don't have a lot of draftsman skills. And it's okay because it's kind of like training wheels. You're, you're learning to see a bit. Uh, but I would always suggest that if you start out like that with all those grid lines, I would suggest progressing to less. So maybe after four or five paintings, you progress to larger grid lines. So instead of two, you know, uh, half inch by half inch, you go to inch by inch, right? And then from there you go to two inches by two inches, like we have here. 
And then you could go uh, two and a half by two and a half. So it'd be these larger. See how you're getting larger? You get some help from the grid, but not as much. But every five or ten paintings, you make your grid lines a lot larger until you get to a point where on most of my paintings, if I grid anything out, it's just going to be a horizontal and a vertical line right through the entire center to kind of give me an idea of central location on things. Yeah. Depending on the complexity, if I work up an image completely in digital format, I feel free to, to grid it out as much as I want. Um, but just know if you continually stay within a really small grid section, that this is hindering your ability to progress uh, in draftsmanship as an artist. And you want to kind of step out of your comfort zone and work away from that as much as you can. So there you go. That's how you work up your nose, uh, your reference images in Krita with a grid. We're going to be working on the original one here. As you can see, the placement's a little bit different, but the, the process is exactly the same. Okay, if any of you have seen my eye tutorial, which was released before this one, um, and that tutorial I started on the same size canvas or board, which is eight by 10, so eight width, 10 tall. And for that reference, I subdivided the entire reference into one inch squares. And I talked about how we always wanted to try and get away from the dependency on the grid. And, but you don't just go cold turkey on it, especially if you're just starting out. One of the best ways i found to kind of wean yourself off of it is to use the grid. But um, as you get better and better, start increasing the square size of the grid. So instead of just one inch squares helping you out so much, you have bigger squares. And that's what I'm gonna do with this one. Uh, I'm going to, well, as you see on the reference, the squares are a lot larger. There are two inch squares all over, so it's going to challenge myself a bit more for the drawing and the painting so that um, I rely more on my own skills rather than the grid telling me what to do. Also, this is an actual canvas board. The previous tutorial for the eye was done on a uh, masonite board that I gessoed. This one is actually a piece of canvas that I glued to the same type of masonite board, uh, which is interesting because this canvas here actually came from the first painting I did of Patrick, which you've probably seen on my website. Um, I painted that painting. Well, I had to start it over because the first one just was not going well. So uh, I took the canvas and I cut it up and I put it onto a bunch of uh, boards and it's been a several years now and it's been sitting here and it's time to paint on it. The other thing about this canvas is you can see there's some discoloration happening within it. That's because that this canvas was already um, primed with gesso and oil paint. And so we're gonna be working on an oil paint layer here. I would suggest you try that. Maybe you can buy a canvas that is already has an oil ground on it just to see if you like it. This is a very smooth oil ground that I, um, I created myself by taking the canvas, doing the gesso and then sanding in between. Uh, and then after you put oil on there, you can sand a little bit as well. But it was so smooth as it was, as soon as you spread the oil all over the place, it kind of fills in the spaces and makes it even more smooth. So this could be a pain, uh, a better painting experience for you or a worse painting experience for you. I find that if you're working this smooth, you have to really use uh, soft brushes like I, I will be using or else like bristle brushes will kind of dig into the paint and pull the paint up and we don't want that. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to draw my grid. I got my trusty ruler here. And this is something I could have done not on video. Whoops. I was about to say that drawing a grid is easy, but then I put a uh, 
wrong tick mark in the wrong space. I'm doing every two inches, not every one inch, Chris. And I'm putting, uh, this is just a, a HB graphite pencil, HB, so fairly hard pencil. And I'm putting it right on the oil paint, or right on the, the, the oil ground canvas. And that's just totally fine. It's not going to affect what's already there. And honestly, you can still see some lines that were there from the previous painting that I did. I'm gonna put X's through those so I know that those are not the lines that I'm gonna be working with. One thing I do whenever I grid out something is I always work from the top left corner and move away from that because sometimes canvases and canvas boards aren't perfectly square. And if I work from one end to the other, it helps smooth out any issues that could be caused within the grid that I'm creating. Kind of brings that accuracy in, in a little bit closer, which we won't need too much because we do have drawing skills to help us out there. And we're gonna use digital means to help us check our drawing. Let me make sure that that's right. Two, four, six, eight. What do we appreciate? Art, art, art. I sound like a seal. Art, art, art. I enjoy art, art, art. I'm being ridiculous and that's fine. Okay, there's my grid. Super simple and easy. We're done, we're completely done. We don't even have to draw a nose. I'm just kidding. So we're gonna be drawing three noses on this canvas. Uh, one is gonna be a front view. The top one's gonna be a front view. The middle one is going to be a three quarter view. And this one down here is gonna be a profile view. And I have some differences in skin tone, differences in nationality and race here, which is really cool. So I have uh, a male nose here. Um, well, however this person identifies, but uh, that nose there, and then uh, this nose here, which looks like it's uh, from a person of African descent, which is a beautiful nose, love that nose, and then uh, another female uh, nose there. So going to be fun to work with all those noses. So let's get to drawing. And we're gonna start with the top nose. Oh, by the way, this tutorial that I'm showing you right now um, is going to be, the top nose will be on YouTube, but to see the tutorial for the other noses, look for my course download or my, tu my tutorial download, wherever I have it download at that point, which could be multiple places if you want to see them all. So the first thing I start with is whatever I see is pretty easy. And usually that's kind of up in the brow. And how I really use these, this grid is I look for shapes or lines of the figure or the face that goes through those lines. And then I capitalize on that. So I saw that where the nose fits into the brow here, that line is going through this vertical and so i'm going to grab that and then what you can do is see where the top of the nose kind of transitions into the side of the face or the side of the nose that makes a bit of a line and it's probably about right there because it's nowhere near halfway you know the other side the other side of the bridge in the nose is definitely halfway in between these two lines so it's about right there so this is how we're using the grid but don't forget about the overall shape. If we look at the angle that comes down from the nose, it's got a very slight angle, like about right there. And we can check that by saying, okay, the, the end of this kind of angle is gonna happen here. So challenging myself more on the drawing than with the eye drawing from our last tutorial. 
And if you haven't checked that out, yeah, check that out because that will give you a lot of the setup, a lot of the information from this tutorial as well, especially how to use a different board, how to get that gessoed up and sanding if you needed to. And see, I'm going to look at um, overall lines more than anything. What do I mean by that? I'm going to look at broader lines here. So the entire shape of the nose, maybe the bridge, how that flows, the entire bottom of the nose. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I can't rely as heavily on the um, grid because it's a much larger grid. So the bottom of the nose is going to be about right here. And maybe you, you know, you can understand or see now how this is challenging my drawing a bit more. You don't need to start out drawing, um, you know, with nothing to help you. It's kind of like uh, training wheels, right? You wouldn't put your kid on a motorcycle like right away and say, go, you know, get at it. <laughs> Uh, no, you start them out with a little bike, you put some training wheels on them with them and then gradually they get better and better and you can lift the training wheels up and then you can eventually take them off. And uh, they're speeding along just fine without them. So as you broaden the squares on this grid, just see that as, you know, transition away away from the training wheels so what i can do is is i could look at let's say the base of the tip of the nose right and i know it's not halfway in between these two lines it's a little bit below that and this is where your judgment comes in so you can you start to be you start to gain that mileage that you, you need for measuring with your eyes, you know, seeing. So that's the base there. And then it's got a corner on the left side, which is about right here. And then this angle goes up. And sometimes what I do is you can't see this, but um, I have, you know, to the left of the camera, over here on my left, I'm looking at my computer screen with the reference on it and I can hold up my pencil um, again, you know, in front of my head and I'm looking at like an angle. And if I was looking at the nose, I'd put my pencil on this angle and then I can kind of move it over to my canvas and then see, you know, kind of get a judgment of that angle. Now, what's interesting is this corner of the nose. This side of the corner is perfectly in the center, a little bit low from the vertical center, but the horizontal center of this square, it's right in there. And this angle is here. And as you notice, I'm also working in straight lines, uh, lots and lots of straight lines. You can see the other wing of this top of the nose and this highlight here. And we're just going to throw another straight line up like that way. One thing that will help you get better at drawing or get your drawing to kind of come together is if you use a lot more straight lines than, than is actually in the image. It's interesting how the human brain works because uh, what I've noticed over the years for most individuals is that we can recognize distances with geometric shapes more than organic shapes. So if we're using these very geometric shapes here, it can help us judge width, height, distances in between items, things like that. I'm going to go ahead and put in this kind of edge of the nose. So this is where the nose uh, flows down underneath the tear duct and it becomes cheek. But the side of the nose is right on this line. 
It probably actually goes up a bit like that. Definitely. And the one thing I need to get is my eraser, my kneadable eraser, so I can clean up that line. And let's see if it actually erases off of this canvas. This could be an advantage of the canvas. Yeah, that comes off pretty easily. That's pretty nice. Now, the one thing with working on a canvas that it already has an oil ground on it, um, you can't seal it. You could probably get a clear oil sealant or whatever, but then you'd have to wait for that to dry before you could start to paint and some problems can kind of run into that. So um, unlike gesso where we, with the eye tutorial, I, I drew on gesso and then I used uh, GAC 100 from Golden to seal my drawing so that when I painted it didn't like move anywhere. The drawing didn't move around. It didn't mix in my paint and anything like that. Here, we'll just have to deal with any kind of graphite mixing in my paint. It's not gonna hurt the paint mixture. It's not going to cause any problems with the painting lasting for, for a long time or the paint coming off the canvas in any way. But it just may discolor some of our colors that we use make them a bit gray, but that's okay. We can deal with that. So every, everything that you do in, in oil painting, I mean, it all has its intricacies, right? So this is the bottom of the nose and we're going all the way out here with this nostril. Top of the nostril is about here. And the one thing that you can do is if you can get the bottom of the nose, this, this uh, angle, then the tip of the nose is going to follow that. The, the two nostrils are going to follow that line. So there will all, always be this kind of constant horizontal line going across in the same angle. Also, what's interesting about uh, the portrait, whatever angle the bottom of the nose is will be reflected in the brow, will be reflected in the lips and in the chin. So it's a, if you get that angle right, you have like all the front plane angles of the face. Um, it will be misaligned slightly due to perspective, uh, but that's only on a three quarter view head. So this is straight on. So we're going to get it. We're going to get it all pretty easy here. The other nostril, which seems really large right now as I'm looking at this. Let's check some of my drawing. I think that's correct. Maybe this side of the nostril needs to be a bit thinner. Maybe that needs to come down a bit. Yeah, right away there's something a bit off with this nostril. Something with these whiffs and things aren't working well. So in our next uh, phase of this, after I get the drawings done, uh, we will double check that with digital goodness to help us figure out how close our drawing is. And I noticed that that line needs to come down a little bit as I keep looking. And this actually comes up a little bit further. It's kind of like a highlight on the bridge of the nose. Then we go up this way where the bridge of the nose continues into the brow. You can probably take, take that up a bit further. And what's interesting is I don't have anything to help me out here. This line is way over here. So I'm going to triangulate from what I've already drawn. So there's a corner here where the, the bridge of the nose goes into the brow and underneath the brow. And we got a corner that's about right there, I would say, and there. And then let's get the side, the small piece of the side of the, the nose in, where it leads into more of the eye socket. 
So there's a particular name for this part of the nose here, this kind of triangular shape that comes down. I forget what it's called. We'll have to look that up. And I can see that there's this nice little flow of a line that goes under the eye and points directly to this, this little intersection of our grid. And the next thing we want to do is get these corners in the corner of the mouth, like the laugh lines, whatever you want to call them. Just kind of get those that direction in. And then let's get the shape of this shadow in. Because we'll want to um, capitalize on this shadow to really pop the nose out when we start painting. It's a very soft shadow. It fades really quickly. And I pulled it out to kind of the very end of where it fades. Now, everything is a little bit connected. Well, it's very connected, not just a little bit. We'll be where I'll be doing a mouth uh, tutorial next, but we'll get a little bit of that filtrum in here. And as I look at that, I can see how the shape of the filtrum is changing the shadow shape. And I did not observe that as well as I could have. So it goes, it dips down into the filtrum then kind of comes back up right there. And there's actually a shadow, like a crescent moon shadow there uh, in the inside right of the filtrum. Okay, so just about done with this nose. Noses are a bit easier than eyes. The one thing I want to put in is halfway on this point, we have a shadow that kind of jumps up this way. We have this really kind of pointy thing, part of that shadow going in. And then this does the same thing. We got this interesting point of either a darker space in the skin or a shadow that jumps up. And I just wanted to kind of capture that. Let's uh, indicate some form here, especially when the shadows are there. Just drop that down and, and I'm really kind of just scribbling in some value there. But I'm also doing it with like against the plane. Trying to describe that form as I'm drawing it as well. See like the very tip of this nose goes down and then out this way. We got a shadow shape that comes over here and this kind of curves down that way. And then of course, this whole bottom area is in shadow. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Okay, happy with that. Let's move on. So here we are back in front of my painting and I have my palette set up now. As you can see here, yay, I got my palette camera in. And I'm gonna go over some materials before we get started on actually painting. I've already gone over my canvas board. This is a masonite board with a piece of canvas that I actually glued to the board uh, that is already uh, oil ground, basically. It has oil ground on it. And then you saw me do the drawing, so there's that. One thing I didn't go over is I have this uh, board taped um, on the back of the board. I have it taped to a piece of foam core. It's really nice to kind of have this kind of black outline around my canvas when I'm working. And if my brush slips off of this, it doesn't go onto something else or whatever. Um, the tape wasn't working too well on the back, so I also have this kind of crazy tape on the front too. I'm not going to be touching these corners, so it's good with that tape. But really helpful pieces of foam core to uh, position your canvas wherever you want. And the palette here, I have, this is actually a handmade thing that attaches to my 
tripod. I have a tripod back there and I made this thing like years ago. It's just a simple clamp kind of thing um, that I can fold up. If you wanna know more about that, send me a message and I can show you how that is built and everything. It's actually kind of a cool palette uh, holder. But my actual palette is, you know, its own thing. You can see it here and it's glass and, you know, it was made pretty cheaply with foam core and a piece of glass and I did this 10 years ago. So this whole setup has been 10 years that I created this setup and I've been working on it since then. Every painting that you see on my website for the past 10 years has been using this setup, exact same thing. Of course, I've gone through paint and brushes since then, but uh, the palette, the uh, palette holder, and my easel has all been the same. So there's that. I'm gonna be using just basic paper towels, uh, paper towels there, and uh, for the brushes, I'll be using exclusively uh, Monarch brushes. This is Winsor & Newton Monarch brushes, M-O-N-A-R-C-H brushes. Um, for today, I'll be using a couple filberts. This is a number two filbert. I love these brushes. They are synthetic, so they don't touch any animals or anything like that. It's just a synthetic brush that uh, is very soft, works really well for the way that I paint. I'm not gonna be using any bristle brushes because I think they're too scratchy. I don't like the way they, they work. Um, I would highly suggest that if you're interested in just brushes and painting with oil paint, uh, experiment, get a few brushes and find what you like and, and work with that. This also works well, or these brushes work really well with the paint that I use, which is exclusively Gamblin. I use all Gamblin paints. And I'll go over some colors, and I need to add a couple more colors to my canvas. One is titanium white, which is usually the color that we use the most as artists. So I'm going to throw some titanium white down there. I, get, I always get the big tube of the titanium white. So Gamblin Titanium White, so that's one. And then we go uh, right up to, this is a Hansa Yellow Medium, also by Gamblin, Hansa Yellow Medium. And then my red is, I have my cart here full of paint that I'm searching through. This is my red, Napthal Scarlet. And then my next and most favorite color of all, which I need to go to the art store and buy more of, this is Transparent Earth Orange right here. I love this, it's wonderful for skin tones of all different types of color skin. Um, Caucasian, uh, brown, everywhere. You know, and unless you're an alien and you're green, then I'll have to get a different palette and that would be really cool to paint anyways. Uh, but this this helps out a lot for getting those kind of warm tones in skin. Really beautiful color. And it's transparent where um, I can use it for a lot of glazes as well. So Transparent Earth Orange by Gamblin. The next one, which I need to put a little bit more out, is Alizarin Permanent. So this is my cool red. It's a very cool red. It's almost like a purple. But this is really great for all of those like undertones and things within uh, skin, especially, you know, my, my color skin, getting all these weird tones within there, those kind of bluish reds. So that's a Lizarin per Permanent, also by Gamblin. And the almost always used on every palette, Ultramarine Blue by Gamblin is right there, top left corner. And some more that I need to put out, this is Raw Umber. Again, you guessed it, by Gamblin, so we're all on bread. Probably not going to use a ton of that in today's session. So there's the raw umber by Gamblin. Be careful, that will dry overnight. So just put out what you need uh, each day. When you come back to it, it'll be completely dry um, because you'll have to replace it every day. And then last but not least, I use a sap green. Why is there a sap green here, right? Um, I find myself always using it to neutralize the warm colors and I have a very warm palette. So um, my burnt umber, my alizarin, my transparent earth orange, my red and my yellow are all pretty warm. 
So I need to do a lot of neutralizing and the, the sap green helps out a lot with that. The last thing I have on here is my Gamblin solvent free gel. I love the solvent free gel. Well, I do everything without solvents. You won't see me use any kind of terpenoid, any kind of solvents whatsoever while I'm painting. I, I li uh, this is a small studio. Even if it was a big studio, I still wouldn't use them. You don't need them, number one, and they're unhealthy for you. So I get the solvent free gel and I like the gel because it sticks to a vertical palette. I like that my palette is vertical. It's very important to me because when your palette is vertical like this, it's going to match the verticality of your canvas. So wherever the light's coming from, it's gonna be more similar on your palette if the palette is in the same orientation. Now you can see that you know really simply. Let's say I put my palette right next to the canvas. I mean, all those colors are gonna transfer just like I was working from canvas to canvas, you know, left to right, it would be right there, right? Um, but if I did something like this, it would get darker, I would see reflections. If, you did, if I did something like this, it would get lighter. So having a palette that is in the same orientation is really nice. Um, that's why I really love this setup. I did it 10 years ago and I've been using it ever since. I mean, you don't have to work that way, uh, but it helps me judge value and color a little bit better. <clears throat> Last but not least is your basic um, palette knife. I use it for moving paints around. If I need to mix up a really big uh, dollop of paint, a big pile of paint, I'll, I'll usually grab the palette knife to help me with that because mixing up big piles of paint with brushes doesn't work very well at all. And uh, for this first session on painting, you won't see me dip into the medium that much at all. Maybe just a little bit if I need to uh, get the paint to move around more. But for the most part, I won't even touch it. Um, and that's all about uh, fat over lean. You want to make sure that the base layers of your paint are structurally sound and dry before everything else. And so you don't want to add a bunch of medium to your burst your first layers. We'll get into that when we do a lot of um, glazing in the secondary layers. If you need some kind of way to thin out your paint at the beginning, maybe you just love it thinned in the beginning, I would say still stay away from solvents. If you must have solvents, don't. I'm just kidding. If you must have solvents, then go with Gamsol. It's still rated the best. Uh, there's another choice is Galkid Light from Gamblin, which I like a lot. Um, this is an Alkid thin medium. It dries really fast. And Alkids are the kind of new thing on the block. So if you want your paint to dry a lot faster, throw the Alkid in there. Uh, you can get rid of you can get rid of even more solvent, although this this has some petroleum distillates in it. Uh, so it's not great for you. It doesn't have a bad smell. Um, so you might want to be careful with that, use it sparingly, but I find that I really don't need it. All right. So let's get started painting. I can't wait. I'm, I'm, I haven't painted in a couple days, a few days, actually. Um, it's the brand new year. So happy new year. Today's January 1st, 2023 that I'm recording this and, uh, can't, and can't wait to have fun and create a bunch more of these tutorials for the new year. So where do I go first? What am I going to do first? The very, very first thing I'm going to do, uh, besides, you know, having my um, reference set up to the left of me, I'm kind of looking over at it. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up my dark color, my darkest dark, actually. And you, you probably look at my palette going, well, you don't have any black on there. How are you going to mix up a dark color? Aha! I have a super secret mixture of, co of dark color. We can do it with these three colors over here. So I'm going to take some burnt umber, throw it in my palette, some ultramarine blue, mix it in with it, and then some alizarin permanent within there. This will achieve a dark color that is super close to black. And the great thing about it is you can adjust this color. It's an actual color. I mean, black is, is a color itself, but it's just, it's all gray tones. You mix black with anything else and it's going to kill it. It's going to really kill those tones. 
with um, with this mixture, I can really push it in multiple ways. I can go into a purple, I can go to a blue, I can go to a very cool red, a very warm red, just by changing how much of each item I have mixed in here. So we'll probably keep it like that. And you probably can't see how, you know, what kind of color this is because of what uh, my phone is probably picking up. But if I add just a tiny bit of white to it, you probably see a lot of that color coming out. And this will give you an indication, like this is a bit closer to purple, kind of a warm, uh, a cool, warm, <laughs> I'm gonna say cool, warm. Uh, it is still a warm color, but on the cool side of warm. So closer to the alizarin permanent. I put a, maybe too much alizarin permanent in there to get that. But I think, I think that's actually gonna work well. So that's my darkest dark. That's the first thing that I'm gonna work up. And what I'm going to do is go, okay, so this is the dark, the darkest dark that I want on my painting and maybe a little bit lighter than that. Um, so I'll probably lighten this up a little bit, just a tiny bit of white to throw in there across the whole thing into this kind of purplish color. And then I'm gonna throw this, uh, we're gonna work on the, the top nose, the first nose up here. And I'm gonna put this right in the darkest areas of this nose, which um, easily enough is within the nostrils. So I'm just gonna throw that down, this side and this side. Okay, so right after I placed those two dark areas within the nostrils you see on the painting, I realized that I forgot a step, a very awesome step that I wanted to show you within checking your drawing um, for um, a, a painting. And so I stopped, I just put those two pieces in and I stopped and I said, okay, well, I need to get back to that. I need to show you that I, I was so anxious to get into the painting phase that I just blew right past that. So we're coming back to this, okay? And what I'm gonna do is because, you know, it so happens that the, where I placed those two pieces of wet paint, I need to actually fix some of the drawing because the nostrils are up just a tiny bit too high. They're too too far up to the closer to the top of the canvas. Um, but this is gonna be great. So how do you fix like some paint that you put down? In this instance, because I can I can probably wipe this off and I have to be careful, really careful with this because um, I can move some of my graphite around that I put on here. It sticks really well, but Let's see, I'm, I just ripped off a little bit of paper towel, just a small bit, and I'm gonna try and scrape it. This is one way you can do it. So that'll take off a big portion of the paint, and you can, you can even make this smaller, like I'm scrunching up this piece of paper towel, so it's just like almost like a little uh, Q-tip. And then there's another thing you can use. You just grab a, a Q-tip, and kind of pull that off. Spread it around a bit, that's fine. That way I can, it's just not thick enough where, or too thick where I can't see any lines that I try and put over it or through it. Another way is to use your, and this is a bit more exact, you can use your palette knife and you can go in there just and really carefully scrape off areas of paint. It won't get it off as much as the um, paper towel will, but you can pull some of it off. I do this a lot. If like, if I put too much impasto paint down, I'll use the, um, palette knife to really kind of work some of that off to scrape a whole bunch of it off. It'll leave kind of an idea of that color down. Um, but then it won't be as thick. So I'm going to, I'm going to remove the rest of this with our paper towel there. Let me try and just spread it around. There we go. I can still see enough lines there to get this fixed. So here we are in Windows. I'm using Windows 10 and I'm going to show you some really great ways of taking the drawing that we just made uh, with these noses and checking the drawing 
within a digital means so you can fix any issues that you have. Now I did make a mistake here. I completely forgot about this step and I started painting, but as soon as I, st I put on these two little daubs on the nose, I was thinking, you know what? I didn't double check this drawing. So I'm back here now and we're going to double check the drawing um, to make sure that the, all the drawing that I have is really good. I mean, in this kind of instance, when I work in a small painting, I probably wouldn't do this, especially when you're just learning. I'm not going to go this deep into getting the drawing correct, but I wanted you to show you, I wanted to show you this process so you can get an understanding of how to use digital formats to check um, your drawing. Now, I am subscribed to Adobe Creative Cloud, the cheaper photography bundle, which has Photoshop and Lightroom. And we're gonna be using Lightroom to set up the orientation of our canvas, which right now is at a very um, kind of weird angle. And that's always gonna happen. I did this intentionally. And then we're gonna fix that first and then change up some of the values within this, this drawing. And then I'm going to take it into a painting software uh, called Krita, which is free, or you could do it in Photoshop um, if you have this bundle and you can check your, your drawing that way. The only re reason why I'm in Lightroom is because I like to be able to fix the uh, perspective or any perspective issues on the canvas before taking it into my other uh, software to check the drawing. So what we're going to do is I imported my image. So the image is here and I'm going to go up here to the top right and hit develop within this image. And now I'm in the develop menu. And the very first thing I'm going to do, I mean, I can zoom in here and you can see the quality of this image is really good. Um, what I'm going to do is go down here to transform. This is probably the most important tool that we'll use and then click on the button called guided. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna give me this kind of little crosshair with a um, zoomed in version of it to the right. So if I scroll over any places here, like where I painted on the nose, you can see that appear. Like the edge of this tape, I can see the edge of the tape. I can see the, the painting in the background zoomed in, you know, this kind of thing. So what you do is you put your crosshair uh, close to the edge of a painting, right? Um, or the lines that we created on the paintings. Let's do the lines that we created on the painting. So you see that line there? So I'm matching the top left uh, crosshair with the one in the center. And then I'm gonna click and hold. It's gonna create this awesome line, okay? And then I'm gonna go to the other end of the painting. Same thing on that line. Now when I let go, nothing happens. But if I do a second horizontal line, let's do this one down here. And what we're trying to do is we want to get these guiding lines to match the lines that we drew on our painting, the grid we drew on our painting exactly. Now, if you and it, when I let go, you can see there, it corrected the horizontal ang angles for this entire image, okay? And if you don't have these horizontal and vertical lines, the grid on your canvas, you can just use the edge of the canvas. It works just as well. So now let's do for vertical. I'm gonna pick out, and in some instances, this is hard to see. So I'm gonna use the edge here. I can't see those lines that I drew. So I'm just gonna use the edge of the canvas. It doesn't have to be super perfect. This will get you 99% there without using the lines in the center. So what that has done is really flattened out this whole image and uh, fixed any perspective issues within the nose, uh, the noses that I've drawn. Also, the great thing about uh, Lightroom is if whatever camera you use, it will have a lot of built-in lens correction. So if I go here with lens correction, it already recognizes my lens, which is the Canon RF 35 1.8 micro. And if there's any lens aberrations, they call it, like um, distortion on the edges or whatever, it will correct those. And so it, it, you'll get a really nice flat image. If you use a cell phone to take photos of your artwork, uh, which is a wide angle lens, you're gonna get a lot of distortion, especially on the outside. So 
uh, checking the drawing from a, a photograph taken from a cell phone is not the best. It's going to be pretty far off unless you correct uh, the and do a lens correction for that particular cell phone. So, and you would have to have that in here. I'm not sure how to do that. So that would be up to for you to research. All right. So the next thing that I'm going to do is go to this little tool, which is crop overlay. And we're going to crop this down, but I know that my original is eight by 10. So I want to crop it to the same ratio. So I'm going to go over here and hit original and that's eight and a half by 11. So I'm going to enter in a custom aspect ratio is going to be eight by 10. Okay. And then I'm going to hit okay. And this is going to give me a crop dialog that has that exact ratio. So I'm going to pull the corner way down and then move my painting inside of this and then increase the size. The reason why I'm cropping at the same ratio is because sometimes when you correct the perspective issues that, that happens with your, uh, the picture that you took, it could change the size of your artwork. And we want to make sure that the size is pretty close. I'm leaving a little bit of edge around here, uh, but that's that size ratio is, is uh, right on. And then if I click away from the crop overlay um, back into this one, you can see that the crop will happen. So there we go. Nice and cropped. I can still zoom in and see all the details and everything, but I want to bump up those details. So the first thing I'm going to do is bump up the contrast for the drawing. Just push that, you know, pretty far up. Maybe not that far. We lost a lot of the lines. And then I'm going to see if I can bump down the shadows to grab more of those lines. No, I'm losing the lines. The main thing I want to do is get those lines. So let's not change the contrast. Maybe the exposure is too high. Okay, there we go. I pulled the exposure down because it was overexposed. And now I'm throwing the contrast up. I brought the shadows all the way down and I'm going to bring the blacks all the way down. And there we have a better look at um, our lines that we put in. So they're really exact, really sharp now. And now what I'm going to do is uh, this is basically done. What I, what I can do because we have a Photoshop and a Lightroom bundle, I can go ahead and take this into Photoshop pretty easily if I right click on it and choose edit in Adobe Photoshop. This is the 2023 version. So edit in Adobe Photoshop 2023. Because right now this image here is in CR3 mode and uh, most other painting softwares cannot open up CR3s. So we're gonna use Photoshop to um, save this as a JPEG. This is great, you know, using Photoshop to save as a JPEG is really great because you can um, save it to your website, save it to Instagram, um, you know, do all kinds of things with it. But we're gonna keep it exactly the way it is. I'm just gonna have to go up to file and then um, export, export as. And then right up here, we want to make sure that that says JPEG, JPG, and then quality will be all the way to the right, as great as it can get, and then hit export. And then I'll pick a file or a folder on my, um, I'm, I'm looking for a particular folder. I'll pick, uh, yeah, it'll be in projects, video, nose tutorial, those are my references. Here's this JPEG that I'm saving out. And there we go. There it is. Now what I can do is I, I could continue on here within Photoshop and I could overlay my reference and this, these images together to really check this drawing. But I'm gonna go into Krita, which is a free painting software and I enjoy it a lot more. So I'm gonna close out Photoshop I don't need to save that any longer. I'm going to close out Lightroom. And here we are in Krita. I already have it up and I'm zoomed way in on my reference. Here's my reference. It's already there. Krita is a free software. I'm not going to get too deep into how to use Krita, but it's, it's a painting software meant for styluses. 
um, you know, something you can draw on freehand with a stylus. And that's what, I'm, what we're going to be doing here. So I'm going to be, ha I'm going to have a new layer that I can draw over. Okay. So there, there I am drawing on my screen and this is going to be really helpful for determining what we need to fix. And sometimes there's, you don't have to fix anything. So I got my reference open. <clears throat> I'm going to hit control O to open the, the image that I just saved, which is video nose tutorial. This is the photo that I just saved. It's going to open up in a new file. <clears throat> then I'm going to hit control and A and then control and C for copy. And you can do the same thing up here. You could go to edit um, and copy control A to select everything. So copy, copy. And then when I go back to my nose tutorial, I'm going to make sure that I'm on um, a particular layer and hit paste. And here I am, my, my nose image, the drawing that we made together is in here. And wow, it's huge. So at this point, I'm gonna hit control T, transform. This is this tool right here, transform a layer tool. And we're gonna transform this layer. But when we do that, we want to make sure that we hold shift. We don't want this to happen. So when I'm transforming this, I'll hold shift and I'm going to make this layer smaller and I'm going to make it pretty small so we can start with um, closer adjustments in a second. Then I'll hit enter to lock that in. But first I'm going to change the opacity on this. Let's change the opacity to like 65%. And then I'm going to bring back my lines. So remember the lines that we put on this? Um, so I have the lines there and now I'm going to zoom into 100% or more than 100%. We're going to go all the way up to 200% so I can see how these things are going. Let me change the opacity of my lines a little bit. They're a bit too dark. And here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm looking I'm selected on that layer. I'm gonna hit T, this will give me my move layer tool and I can move that layer, okay? And the first thing I'm gonna look for is uh, the, the grid that we put on the painting itself is here, like you can see that in the painting. And the top left corner of that grid, I'm gonna put within the top left corner of this grid. So I'm matching them up. And that's at the top left. But then if I move down to the bottom right, you can see that these corners don't match up. We want them to match up. So I'm gonna hit Control T again, so I can transform this layer, hold Shift, and I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller than what it would line up to be. So about right there, okay? And then I'm going to go back up to the top right, and you can move things around by holding the space bar like that. Uh, let go of spacebar, and then I'm going to align that corner up. I'm going to go back, and I can see that uh, we're getting closer. Holding shift while I'm moving this. And in some instances, it won't be perfect. We're not going for perfection here. We're going for pretty darn close probably a little bit smaller, just going back and forth and lining this up as best as I can to really check my drawing. So there's all kinds of things that can happen that would make this not line up perfectly usually with lenses, taking photos. And that's the reason why I jump into Lightroom and fix that perspective as much as I can is because um, matching up these lines would, oops, would not work very well. And if you move something out of place, like I just did there, you can control Z will get you back. And that's the same for any software control Z. Okay. So my grid on my painting is lined up perfectly. Just about, there's some things that are a little bit off, but that's okay. This will get us close enough. The rest of it we have to do ourselves um, as artists. We have to kind of figure out, right? What I'm gonna do is basically turn off all those layers that I just created 
I'm gonna have a blank paint layer up here and I'm gonna mark off. I'm gonna get like this little tiny brush. Okay, this is not super tiny. I'm gonna get this small brush, make it even smaller. So I have these little tiny lines, oh, not that small, not that big, maybe a, maybe a three. There we go. And, and red is good here. Red, you can see just about anywhere, like a hot pink or something like that. And I'm just gonna get in some specific landmarks. So the end of the bottom of the nose, the top of the um, nostrils, this kind of thing, the bottom of these nostrils, the wings of the nose, how they kind of fly out. Uh, maybe this shadow here, which is an important shadow to describe the form, this highlight. So I'm just kind of tracing a few things, right? That line that I grabbed, I remember when I was drawing that side of the nose. And yeah, that's enough. We don't need any more than that because our drawing is going to be pretty darn good, I'm sure. So I bring the drawing back up and wow. There's some differences there, more differences than I would thought. And that's really interesting. So you can see that, and if, if I change the opacity just a little bit, maybe you can see the, the person behind there. You can see that this nostril, the where I painted, which I'll have to fix that, is a bit too high. So right there is a bit too high, like it's uh, off, right? So the nostril should be a bit further down. I got the left side of the notch nostril. The wings are pretty good. But yeah, this, this whole area needs some fixing. But the biggest fix I see is that highlight on the bridge of the nose. Let me double check the image. Well, I would say that the corner of the nose is in the right place, but the highlight exists. Like the corner of the bridge of the nose is really running like this and down but that highlight kind of spans the whole thing. What I might do is just remove these extra lines and focus on, on that, because that would describe the nose just fine. Yeah, definitely. And this is important. There's kind of a, a light tone that happens throughout there. Just kind of getting an indication of that. And I can see that that line is off a little bit um, the tear duct line uh, over here that I have, uh, which is, I didn't draw very well at all digitally. I can put that in. This goes down this way. This one up this way. I can see that that's way off. So that this is the drawn line, but the actual line is way off. So we're just kind of testing our lines here, kind of figuring this stuff out. Here's this edge going up that way, this shadow down here. I could be a bit more exact with this drawing, but it's it's not like a huge deal. Um, the shadow shape, let's get that shadow shape in because I, I know that that was important, especially with the philtrum kind of going this way. And for beginning artists, this is just fantastic feedback. What you don't get a lot of times in art school or anywhere else is this just um, unsubjective, very objective, direct feedback of, hey, your drawing is off in exactly this way. Uh, and what you can do from this is you don't use it as a crutch. The reason why I'm showing you this is not because I use it all the time. It helps me with really complex drawings, maybe something that's you know, out of my league, right? But where it really helps is allowing you to get that feedback so you can see what you normally do incorrectly a lot of times, right? What do you judge incorrectly? And then um, under, getting that understanding of where your incorrect uh, judgments are happening, like I have here with the bridge of the nose, you know, maybe I should look at noses a bit more, you know, in that aspect, try bridges more of the nose, draw noses more to get a bit more exact. Uh, with getting that exact objective feedback, I, I can improve a lot faster. So this will be a, uh, probably one of the best tools for you improving your drawing as quick as possible. Now, 
I'm going to be using a, a different pencil for my secondary lines. So these are the fixing lines and I want, uh, this is a mechanical pencil and a, I'm using a much softer lead. So it'll make a lot darker line. And so I can put really dark lines in here now. So the first thing I'm going to do is fix that nostril area. So I can see, you know, the little lines that I put in there to indicate where uh, major parts of this end, major parts of the nose would, would end in some way. Not worrying about being super accurate with this. The top of the nostril ended up there. This is, let me see, the bottom of the nostril is actually here. The bottom of the wing of the nostril is there, so fixing that. This one's about right on. I, I could have, I honestly, I could have kept the paint on that one. It wouldn't have been far off enough to be a, a big issue. And then this guy comes out a bit further and goes there. And then my shadow shape is a bit larger. So I'll go this way, comes into there. goes down into the inside of that filtrum and comes up, which is really cool to see on the reference when I was working with that. Now the bigger fix that I'm going to do, because a lot of these lines are good here, the biggest fix is going to be the shifting of this bridge of the nose. Actually goes around there. The highlight is here. So that's fine. And then this side of the nose, like the, the slope of the nose as it goes into the side of the cheek and everything. About like that. And then this corner up here is a little bit different. That's actually pretty good. We go up that way and there. Okay. Yeah, those are my fixes. And that's good. You know, not a lot there. Not a lot to change. Maybe I'll bring this lighter side a bit down. There. Oh yeah, the corner here needs to come down a bit. Where that nostril kind of turns into shadow. It turns and then goes in a shadow right there. Okay. So where I left off from painting was I mixed up this really dark color. I'm going to put the darkest dark do down right after I move that note that my reference back so I could see it as I lean in front of the camera. Sorry about that. But I'm going to put this, these dark uh, tones back right there. So I put my darkest darks back in there. And you're probably asking, well, why are you putting these dark darks down first? What's the purpose of that? Well, the purpose is to establish a value range. And when you establish this value range, what you're saying is, I'm not gonna put any other paint on the canvas that is darker than this right now, okay? It helps you because you can look at your reference, you can look at what you're painting, whether that's in a photo or real life, and you say, okay, what is the darkest thing that I see? What is the, the darkest dark ever? And then you mix that up, and then you adjust it a little bit so that it's um, a little bit lighter, so you can have broader range within your darkest darks. And then you know that nothing else you mix on your palette is going to be darker than that. So if you mix up another color and it's darker than that, it's definitely wrong, especially when you're dealing with something like atmospheric perspective and landscapes and all kinds of other stuff. So establishing that really dark dark is super helpful for getting that level set. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is on the other side of the coin. The other side of the value uh, range is I'm going to mix up my lightest light. 
And my lightest light will never be white. If you ever put white right on your canvas, you probably are either painting like a white building in sunlight or you're trying to paint the sun itself and you shouldn't be looking at the sun anyways, but or not directly at the sun. Um, but nothing is ever going to reach, you know, this brightest bright unless it's the sun or sunlight reflected off of a white building. And that's where we'll get the brightest bright, especially when dealing with Caucasian skin. And I always show people this. I'm saying um, when you paint skin, so you're looking at my hand here and we can look at the lighter part of my hand. There's a lot of very light parts in my hand here or my arm, right? Um, but when I put white up against it, like the white of this paper towel, you can see how the lightest lights possible, even the, the highlights on my fingernails are nowhere near the whiteness of this paper towel. And that's where your titanium white is. That's where it's at. So our whitest white will be nowhere near that. Our lightest light will be nowhere near that. So I'm going to mix up just a general tone within all this. And it's going to bring the value down. Just a mixture of my red, my yellow, and my transparent earth orange. And just really bring all this down. Okay. Now this is probably, you know, is this the right color? I don't know. It's not a big deal if I do know. Because this is the first color that I'm putting on my canvas as far as a skin tone. This is the first skin tone that I'm putting on my palette as well. And so as long as I can get an idea of value, because that that comes first, right? And you could put it up maybe uh, like I have my palette, my um, paper towel here. And if I just put, you know, some of that on there, I know it's a lot darker than that. And that's good. Maybe I need to make it even darker, you know, like maybe right around in that tone, okay, is probably our lightest light. So this would be our lightest light right here. And where would that go? That is going to be on the highlight of the nose. And this is really interesting because now I've put this lightest light in and it's darker than the light color of the canvas. So we know that everything around the, this is my lightest light. So everything around it needs to come down really far in order to be in line within values. And the first, first, first thing that you worry about, uh, that is, you know, and at this stage of the painting, the first thing you worry about is your values because we have our drawing down. We've not only get, got the drawing down, but we've, We've gotten some lines in here to understand the form as well. We know how the nose curves a bit on either side, how it, it transfer, uh, transforms or um, the planes transfer from the top to the front to the bottom, how the shadow works and things like that, where it flows. So we know the drawing, we know the form. The very next thing we worry about is the value. And we don't worry too much about the hue because you have three things within color. You have uh, hue, saturation, value. Value is the most important when you're beginning. If you can get the value correct next, because you got the drawing and the form correct, if you can get the value correct next, it doesn't matter what colors you put down. I could be mixing up the brightest colors in the world right here, but as long as my values are correct, the form would be will reflect that. It will look fine, okay? So that's one of the most important things to realize is uh, values are next and don't worry too much about the color uh, that that can be adjusted later. All right. Now, when I say color, I should probably define that a little bit better. When I say color, sometimes like in that aspect, I really meant hue because you have value first hue and saturation hue and saturation really doesn't matter at this stage as, as much it's not really about that it's about the value so i don't really care if this is oversaturated color i don't care um, if it's the wrong hue you know and when i say wrong i mean like not perfectly exact because we'll get pretty close um, 
but it's the, the value that's more important. And what I'm doing, I'm mixing up a pile of paint that is darker than what I have here, than my lightest light. And I'm, I'm, going, I'm trying to go for a color that's darker than that, that kind of matches this person's skin tone in some way. So I know this is my lightest light. And it's kind of like I'm painting on my palette first before I'm painting on my canvas. So I'm looking at how, to, how these two colors interact. And when I squint my eyes, when I squint down, which is I'm closing up my eyelids so that the eyelashes kind of overlap, I can see that the light side of the nose, the bridge of the nose, and the highlight that I put down is not too far away from each other. So not that far away, like I just mixed up. So I'm gonna lighten it up a bit with some white. A bit more white, but you have to remember that white is blue. White will cool off things as well. Let me see what that looks like. That's a bit too, too dark as well. So we're getting lighter and lighter here. I'm gonna add some warmth back into this. So I'm really kind of testing this value on my palette. And I think that's right. That's got it. And this is going to be this area of the nose here, all the way up. Right before it turns into the other side. And I'm gonna put this in a lot of places. And the way I work, especially in this phase, is I work in these uh, little daubs of paint. I'm gonna actually add a little bit of alizarin permanent here to change the hue of that just a tiny bit. But I, I work in these little daubs of paint. And the reason why I do that, because it, it does, I could do several things with this. See, that's a bit dark. I don't want it that dark. Um, I can put down color and put down value. And at the same time, I can use these little strokes to describe the form. I'm describing the side of this nose and the angle of the plane or the curve of the nostril or the flatness right here at the bridge of the nose, but it does turn on this side. And this color is going down in a lot of places probably gets a bit darker from what I can see when we get down into the lip and everything here. The cheek that goes over that way. I can't go too far because now this nose is too close to the other nose. <laughs> All right, so that's my light. You know, just added a bunch of that light in there. Probably take it up all the way to here. All right, so there's that. Okay, so the one thing else that I would I would talk about here is I have two brushes as I'm working here. I have a dark brush and a light brush. And I do that to kind of keep, you know, paint mixture separate uh, to, to try and keep the paint as um, unmuddy as possible. So, but you, you have to kind of really get into that rhythm of, and remember to switch brushes. If you go to the dark areas, the dark side, you gotta use a dark brush. The light side, you gotta use a light brush. And a lot of times I forget and I'll mix them up and it's not a big deal, but you can get them back to where they need to go. So we're gonna go to the dark side of the nose. And what's interesting is I look up here within the shadow under the, the ridge of the uh, brow is pretty dark, but it's not as dark as the um, holes in the nostrils or the shadows in the nostrils, but it's pretty close. So I can lighten this up with white or I could do something different. Let's bring red into this and lighten it up with red and add a little bit more saturation in that area. Maybe a bit of yellow to make it a little bit lighter 
And so we're lightening with color. We're making another color brighter with, instead of just using white to make everything lighter, we have this range of colors that we can use. And one of the things that I tend to always do is ask the question. I have, you know, a mixture of paint and I need to change its value, you know, change what it looks like. So where does it need to go? And usually the first question is, does it need to be lighter or darker? In this case, it needed to be a little bit lighter. And then does it need to be warmer or cooler? And then you go further, you can say, well, does it need to be um, like a, a cool red or a cool blue or a warm red or a warm blue, you know? So warmer or cooler. Probably just ask saying warmer or cooler is just fine. Now the next one is down this side of the nose. Now I have this darker mixture here and then I look at my reference and I go, well, this part of the nose is definitely lighter. So I need to go lighter. And it gets a bit more grayer. So I have this like high saturated color mixed up. So now white will do well because white is a blue. And if I have a warm mixture, I can add white into it and that will desaturate it. But now I'm going right to purple because there's a lot of alizarin permanent in here and I need, I need to bring it back from purple. We don't want purple right now. So I'm going to add some burnt umber which is an orange itself. It's a very dark, very subdued orange. Okay, and now I need to get a bit darker. So more umber I can darken that and keep in it a bit unsaturated. And let's see what happens with this one. Putting my paint daubs down. Describing that form slightly. And I could probably even take the shadow out just a little bit. Try to go over your lines whenever you're painting. And I've, I haven't done that yet, and I'm going to do it now. Don't um, kind of baby your lines. Don't worry about them being perfect. We're not uh, doing, a, you know, what do you call it? Uh, paint by number. If you do that, like, uh, all of your edges will look too sharp and it'll kind of turn cartoony in a lot of ways. We're painting, not making cartoons. Well, I guess you could paint a cartoon and that would be good too. Okay. And that value that I mixed up is going to go all the way down this side of the nose. There's a nice little stripe that it enters there. all the way through here. And then this nostril hat, see the lines that I put on the drawing? I need to reflect those lines when I put these colors down, these values down. I'm describing the form every, with every brush stroke. In a lot of cases, you'll put your brush strokes down and you'll feel like, well, maybe I, you know, it's so dark. I don't really think that that's describing, you know, where it's going. I mean, how are you going to notice that? Or maybe it's really thick. Believe me, you know, our eyes pick up a lot of subtleties. And uh, with this kind of method where you're always describing the form within your brush strokes, um, it will be almost subliminal. People pick it up and they go, oh, wow, I can feel that form. Now, I, I push it a bit to the extreme. This is more of a stylistic concern or idea using this way of painting. And take that all the way around. And one thing I want to do, I want to lighten it up a bit for 
and a bit more red, some intensity in there for the reflected light that hits on the bottom side of this nose. And I'm getting a bit exact here, so I'm leaning forward and I'm putting my palm of my hand on the, the canvas. Still describing that form there as well as I can with these little small strokes. And I'm bringing that lighter color all the way around, describing that form, going over my lines a little bit. Gonna get a little bit lighter here, probably bring it into my flesh tone color over here. Because this shadow of the nose is pretty darn light. It's almost like a half tone that I just mixed up here, which is wonderful because that's in a lot of places like the top of the wing of the nose over here. How the half tone transitions into the shadow on the bridge of the nose here. The Ooh, that's way too dark. I'll have to go to my light brush for this side. So I'll switch to my light brush real quick, bringing in a lot more of this transparent earth orange. And I'm gonna go over here to this side. And I can tell right away that like that's a bit too intense. So how do you change the intensity of orange? You add a little bit of blue. And that will gray out that mixture. This very simple limited palette I have here, I can achieve just about everything with it. There's some really intense colors that I, it's that are it's hard to achieve with any palette, any limited palette. But I can get pretty close. And a lot of it's just relative, honestly. If you have a very gray painting and um, any other color you put on there that is anywhere close to high saturation will look uh, super intense. So it's all about that um, relativity. Yeah, that's a bit too orange. I want more of a warmer red here. And I totally killed that. I mean, it, it, it oversaturated it with red. So there I am there. And that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, so I, I totally killed that color. Too much red, but that's fine. I could probably use that red in multiple places. So added some white to it, because white, again, is a blue, and it will cool that off and lighten it up. That's exactly what I needed to do. Probably need to go a bit lighter on that. But I like some of those intense colors to show through in a lot of places, so it's, it's definitely okay um, that some intensity is there, at least for right now. So what I can do is I can drag it down here into that larger pile that I've mixed up and pull that around. I, I think oil painting or oil paint itself is, is pretty darn forgiving, honestly. Especially if you work in a way where at the beginning like this, these beginning stages where you're really kind of figuring out what are these colors? Um, in these stages, it's, uh, you put the colors down pretty lightly, not, not very thick, and the adjustments come pretty easily. So I wanna go ahead and do a little bit of this cheek where the, the nose kind of transitions in to this side. I actually want some of that orange now, especially right here. And it gets, it gets a lot darker as we go down. Add in some burnt umber and transparent earth orange, a little bit of my dark mixture there. And I can pop all these little strokes in over here. And I can use this color that I'm putting down this paint that I'm putting down to mix into that darker area as well. I'm gonna jump into my dark brush and go to this side, 
Make this a little bit warm. Because then that filtrum here it gets a bit warmer. Throw that in. And hopefully you can see this, but with, you know, just taking our time, working with these little small daubs kind of in areas, it's taking shape slowly but surely. This whole little painting is taking shape. And what I found by working this way, I mean, I enjoy working this way. Um, you may not, and I would suggest you try it or, or whatever if you want to. But what I found by working this way is I can get closer to um, the reality of what I'm trying to paint a lot faster. I think um, lots of artists are taught, and I was taught, to work from general to specific and never to touch the, you know, anything specific until the very end. Um, I've never really enjoyed working that way, honestly. So I changed it up because, you know, I enjoy this more, adding some intensity within this as well. So working within these little daubs of paint and building it up that way. So I'll get right to the detail and you're probably noticing I'm, I'm switching back and forth from my light and dark brush pretty quickly now. Just things that I'm seeing that I need to add in, like the halftone transition from light to dark. I'm getting a little bit more exact with that. The transition down here from shadow, which is very soft on this edge into the light colors that I placed down. And then I can go back to my uh, much darker colors down here. So if I have a lot, uh, this is my dark um, brush that I'm working with, but I had a lot of the lighter paint mixed in, in there. So what I'll do is I'll put it inside of my, um, my paper towel and I'll just kind of squeeze that, that paint out. So it's, it's pretty dry. And then I can go back to these much darker mixtures without affecting them way too much. I mean, there's a little bit of paint in there, so it does affect it a little bit, but not, not as much as, not, not enough to really change that value where it'll be a problem. I do need to get darker underneath this area, underneath that nostril. So I'm gonna go right into my darkest dark, because I already have some lighter paint there and these will mix together and it should make the value that I want there. Now yeah, that got pretty close. And so with these daubs, with these testing, this constant little testing of these little tiny pieces of paint, I'm getting closer and closer to the reality of what I'm seeing. Closer to the value, closer to the color, closer to the hue, I mean and then closer to the, the saturation as well. I see this wonderfully intense red that's happening on this side of the nostril. It's kind of like a highlight that jumps in there. That's a lot brighter than I thought. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's fun. And then I'm going to jump up here with this color, lighten it up just a little bit. For this side, get that blend of the dark uh, plane of the side of the nose into the side of the face. While I'm with those darker colors or somewhat darker colors, I can bring these values closer in with a little bit of blending there as well. Just really making smaller adjustments now. Now what's fun about this, what's, what um, you will see and understand a bit more later, but 
This is just the first layer of paint. Uh, the way I like to work is this will be the first layer. And a lot of these pieces of the canvas will show through. And I'll leave it like that. And then when I come back to this painting after this layer is dry, I work in um, glazes and I'll glaze over this using similar methodology, but mainly with glazes and the, the interest, the uh, richness of the, all the colors and everything on here will just uh, really pop out. All this texture will kind of come into play. All the form will come into play that I've been describing. Yeah, the second phase of this painting is where it's a lot of fun. And you, you know what's great is as I'm getting uh, closer and closer to what I'm actually seeing in the reference, I see that the first st things that I put down, which was the highlight, is nowhere near where it should be. I mean, it's close, but it's a yellow. It's like this kind of orangey yellow color. Um, I'm going to grab a big dollop of uh, titanium white. And I need to bring that orange down even more. Let's add in some alizarin permanent and more white. And I'm leaving that little dollop of white right next to this so I can make sure that I'm really far away from it uh, as far as value is concerned. I don't want to get back to that white. Yeah, this is what I want somewhere closer there. Let me pull some of this out. Now, because I've, I've worked to get everything else around it looking good, the relativity of the paint is telling me that this is what's wrong now. So let's throw our new highlight in that we fixed. And now think about it. This is one thing I'll say. If you worked in the broad kind of stroke manner where you, you laid in all of these broad areas of paint and you did it really thickly and it was all orange, you'd have to fix that orange everywhere. So within these little daubs of color that I'm working with, it's thin, they're easy to adjust, they're easy to manipulate and move forward with. And I'm describing the shape of this highlight, how it curves down the nose. It's really interesting how it kind of curves off to the left and comes back. I probably had that curve a bit too extreme. It, it's really affecting the uh, the shape of the nose a bit more than I'd like. Ooh, I touched into that orange a bit, and that's fine. Because this is lighter. Right there. And then this is lighter right here. Maybe a bit lighter. It's looking pretty good. All kinds of things still need, need to fix to bring it, bring it where it needs to be, but we're getting closer and closer. I'm going to go back up here to my uh, a bit darker value because I see a nicer transition right here that I can grab. Oof. I must have, I must have touched something too dark for that. Side, it got a bit too dark there. A little bit more red. So a lot of things that happen within working this way, it's kind of like Surratt works, is you'll get physical mixtures of paint and then you'll also get optical mix mixtures of paint. Optical mixture is kind of, you know, if you paint, if you put a uh, yellow and blue close together and you stand really far back, black, eh, really far back, 
they'll look like a green. So yellow and blue make green. So you get this kind of optical mixing. And that's what uh, Surratt worked with a lot. That's what he really enjoyed was those optical mixtures that were happening. Ooh, there's nice little lighter color on this side of the filtrum. Need to grab that and that's a bit too light, but that's okay. Because there's darker colors all around it, all I need to do is just kind of blend that in, maybe grab a darker color, darker value. Move those daubs around and I'll get what I want. I'm gonna go back to my, to this, to my dark brush. Uh, make it a bit lighter. So I'm getting, my dark brush is actually turning into my light brush now. They're getting very similar to it. But I wanted to get, try and get rid of some of that orange there on that side of the nose. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a quick break, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna look and see what we got here. So as I stood back, and I would suggest at least every 20 to 30 minutes, if you're sitting, that you stand up and you stand back from your painting. If you're going really fast and like putting all kinds of stuff down, st stand back and look at your painting even more often uh, because things will jump out at you and say, hey, 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 stop, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, or this is wrong. <laughs> And uh, you'll, you'll see things that, that will jump out at you and you'll say, oh man, I really need to fix that because it's all, it's all bad. It doesn't look right. And the one thing that I saw was the nose looks a bit broken. And this side of the nose, this darker shadow is doing this kind of curve thing. And it doesn't do that on their nose. It's more of a, a straight line all the way down. So a straight line. So I need to take that through to the wing of the nostril. And if I, if I lose that little light area on the side of the nostril, I think that's fine too. Then I need to make sure that I define this as really a straight form. And this is all drawing. I mean, we're going to be drawing as we're painting all the time. That's a very square form. It goes just straight up. So I'm going to jump to my lighter brush here. Now, if you think about the hierarchy that I was talking about, which is the paint, the drawing first, get the drawing right first, then value, then color, then all that. It's more important that I sacrifice my value right now um, to get the drawing correct. And I can see right away that my nostril here has kind of lost some of its edge as well. making some corrections, some necessary corrections. Trying to straighten this nose up. I don't want to do them a disservice and make their nose look like it's broken. I don't think they would like that. Probably what I'm going to do is go into my light area, my light side. Oof, much lighter. And I'm reinforcing the straightness of that line as much as I can.
Now there is a very slight half tone that's happening over here. I think I made it too dark. That's why uh, the nose was looking broken is because it moved that shadow just too much. again. Really observing now, taking my time. You can tell when I'm working my brain really hard because I'm not talking as much. I'm not telling you what I'm doing as much. And if you watched me, I mean, if you could see my me, what you would see is my eyes are going back and forth from what I'm painting to the, the reference really fast, like kind of back and forth, back and forth and getting this kind of comparison. But my head is staying in the same place constantly. Like I barely move my head. It's mostly my eyes moving back and forth really helps to get a better comparison if you use that method. It's kind of like an optical comparison where maybe there's a bit of after image of your reference. And as you look back and forth, it kind of overlays itself within your brain. Not sure if that really happens, but that's what it feels like. That might be pretty good. One thing I do want to grab because I really like this, illustrators do it all the time, is when you have a terminator in the shadow area, they will make sure that it's described well. It really helps to turn the form. What's a terminator, Chris? Terminator is a part of a shadow shadow side of a sphere, you will see this really easily. So you, you have the light side of the sphere, like on the nose, like the highlight, then it goes into a lighter area. That's where the half tones are. And then you enter the shadow and right at the, um, inside the shadow in between where the shadow turns into the darkest dark and you get some kind of spill back like at the bottom of this nose of reflective light in between those two things will be really dark. They call that the Terminator. Lots of illustrators take advantage of that by uh, emphasizing the Terminator. Of a shadow. Drew, uh, Drew Strusend, an illustrator that did, you know, posters in the 80s for movies, still does a lot of really amazing stuff. Um, some of my most favorite movies ever, like the poster for Back to the Future. I think maybe he did some Star Wars posters and things like that he would utilize that Terminator a lot. So if you look at his work, you'll see what I'm talking about. So I think at this point, well, except for one thing, I was getting ready to stop, but I'm gonna fill in some of this up here where a lot of that canvas is showing through. But at this point, after I fill this, these little bits in and maybe get a little crazy with some color, add some brighter red there, some more intense red, at this point, I'm going to say that this um, is done. This layer of paint is done. And we'll continue working it up on the next layer. And we'll refine it even more with glazes 
and a lot of fun stuff. So I can't wait for that. But before we get to the second layer of that nose, we're gonna paint the other noses before then. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. And then uh, after all those, all the noses are painted, I'll let this dry for a few days. As I'm looking at this and thinking about the painting, because I see a couple things I wanna change. Yeah, that got that got a bit too light down there. This is where the the side the nose kind of changes into a um, to the front of the nose. Like the change of plane there needs to be a bit more dark, and it needs to be described better. Yeah, and then underneath a bit of that shadow color. I'm going to leak that into some of that there. Maybe lose that edge a bit. Take some of this darker color out here to the side of the nose and just hint of that. Okay. All right, all right, this is good. This is good now. You can put it down for right now, Chris. Put it down for right now. So the next step is, is to paint the other two noses, then let this dry for several days, and then uh, come back to all three of the noses with the second layer. And that layer is gonna be fantastic. Gonna be a lot of fun. You'll see uh, the magic happen then. Okay, we're back. It's probably been minutes for you, but it's been days for me, and now, this painting is completely dry. I can rub my hand all over it, my finger. Nothing's coming off, even in the lighter areas. I think it's taking like three or four days, especially for these lighter areas to dry well enough to continue on. You wanna make sure that you let it dry to the touch so it's it's not even tacky really, but uh, you don't want it to let, let the paintings dry for more than like five or six months or anything like that. So yeah, here we are, and now it's time for the really fun part. I've had days and days to continually look at this painting and figure out what I want to do and make changes. And within this glazing layer that we're going to put on, um, it's going to be a lot of fun to subtly adjust everything that we put down and make it really pop and stand out and look even better than it is. The one thing that I would say is, you know, most of my palette here is transparent or semi-transparent uh, paint. And you want to make sure that you use as much transparent paint as you can. And when I say transparent, I mean right out of the tube. Um, Gamblin and most other paints right on the back of the tube, it will indicate if the paint is um, transparent or semi-transparent. So semi-transparent or transparent, just as fine. Either one is good. We're gonna be adding medium into this. Uh, just a reminder, we're using the solvent-free gel by Gamblin. Uh, you can use any kind of oil medium that you would like here. I use no solvent, so it's important for me. There's also the um, solvent-free fluid medium, but it doesn't want to stick to a vertical palette, so I don't use that. You could use linseed oil or whatever, um, as long as it's thinning out the paint a bit more so you could see through it. But the transparent paints, such as my transparent earth orange, as in its name, if I spread it out, we basically see right through it. So that's very transparent. Some things are semi-transparent, like my um, ultramarine blue or uh, alizarin permanent. No, that's transparent. Semi-transparent would be the um, this Hansa yellow medium. So if I take some of this out and I spread it around, you can see that you can see through it, but maybe not as well, right? So that's semi-transparent. Um, but it's important to use transparent paint when you're glazing. And even if you have an opaque paint, like my white here is opaque, 
the there's some other transparent whites out there um, there's a flake white which is transparent but it has lead in it and i don't want lead in my house so there you go not using that but if you have an opaque paint uh, you can make it transparent by adding in a lot of your medium and that will you know thin it out enough so it's transparent but when, when you're doing glazing, you want to use as pure color as possible. So for example, my transparent earth orange, I'm gonna put it on the palette and then add some medium to it so it's even more fluid, moves around as much as I can. And then when I throw this paint that I just mixed up on the nose up here, let's say on the bridge of the nose because it gets a bit darker right here, you can see how intense that color is, but you can see right through it. And, you know, as I look at that, I think, well, that's way too intense for that part of the nose. But it's totally fine because a lot of this medium, a lot of this um, glaze is so thin that even with your finger, you can kind of rub it out. So it's just barely there. It's like, like a, a hint of a change. Um, and going over that with other colors and things like this, you can easily adjust, easily, easily adjust. So this is, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through the nose. We're going to adjust values. We're going to add intensity in some areas to add some more life to this. Um, we're going to maybe change some hues in some ways, darken some things, lighten some things and then overall make this nose stand out and a bit more interesting, definitely. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is I'm gonna grab my other brush because I'm gonna use this other brush as my dark brush. And I'm gonna grab, I'm going to make up a dark, my dark color, Burn Umber, Altering Blue, a little bit of Alizarin Permanent. And as you can see, even this, these colors here, are um, have a transparency to them. I think the only thing, let me see, I'm gonna read on the tubes real quick if I can find them. The alizarin permanent is transparent, definitely. I knew that one. The burnt umber is semi-transparent and the ultramarine blue is transparent as well. So we have two transparent paints and a semi-transparent. We're basically gonna get a very transparent black. Okay, our transparent dark color. But I wanna mix this up, maybe a little bit more alizarin permanent. Gonna add in some medium so it moves around. And then we're gonna go with the darks. But before that, before even that, um, what you will find on a lot of paint is that after it dries within a few days, it loses its luster. Um, and a lot of paints will get very dull and it's hard to see the colors. Um, then you'll have parts within the painting where some of it's shiny and some of it's really dull. And it's kind of like, oh man, I, I don't really understand what's going on. I can't see the colors well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna oil out. Now what is oiling out? And this is something I do before I get into um, doing any glazes because it, it helps with the glazes as well. So I'm going to use some refined linseed oil. Um, on one of the previous tutorials, I used my, uh, well, the, the tutorial for eyes, I used my um, solvent-free gel to oil out, but you can use the refined linseed oil to do this as well. It's a little bit more fluid. I got a brush that's completely clean and I'm going to dip it into this refined linseed oil right and get just a little bit on that brush and then i'm going to take it all over the top of this nose okay and very lightly i'm just going to move this oil around everywhere and hopefully you can see it on camera but the especially the dark places i mean it looks like i just put the paint down on the canvas it's like christmas day here it's fantastic this is one of my favorite parts of oil painting. Everything gets dull and then as soon as you oil it out, it brightens up just like you painted this beautiful nose yesterday or five minutes ago. 
It, it happens again if you're, let's say you're finished painting, the painting's dry for six months, it's completely uh, dull, and then you add a varnish to the painting, and wow, is that fantastic. The whole painting just kind of comes to life again. It's a lot of fun. Now you wanna keep this really thin. What I'm doing is I keep pulling oil out of my brush and move it around on the nose a bit more, working in different angles. You could use a bigger brush to move this around easily, but I like using the smaller ones uh, and that's fine. And make sure that you're covered every area by going to the side and kind of looking off to the side and seeing the glare, making sure that you covered every place and it's really thin. No drips, no nothing, just super thin. We don't want it to affect our paint that much. So there you go, we have oiled out. I can see the colors really well. It's fantastic. And you only wanna do that within the section that you're working with right now. So I'm just gonna do this nose because I don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe I'll have to stop after this nose and come back to it uh, tomorrow. And so I don't wanna have, if you oil out a section and you don't work on it, um, it's probably not, you know, I haven't experienced any problems with that, but I would rather the oil not just sit on top there and dry, right? Um, I would rather put the glazes into it in the section I'm working with and then move on, you know, within another day or, or whatever. So, okay, now we can get into it. Now we can get into it. I'm gonna go back to the dark color that I mixed up with my dark brush here. And we're going to darken up the nostrils first. And that, with glazing, you can get the darkest darks you've ever seen. With a lot of depth in them, it's kind of like looking into voids because what happens is the light will pass through the glazed layer, hit the paint underneath and come back through the glazed layer and then hit your eye. And it makes everything look uh, even more rich and dark. It's fantastic. So, and I can move this around in places. I'm always going to continue describing the form as much as I can. This shadow shape has a form. It kind of comes down this way. And just enhancing. I mean, even with that, we've popped the nose out a bit further. We've increased that contrast. It's looking better right away. And as we're doing this, as we're doing the glazes, all these little dots of canvas that's showing through will fill in. And uh, that will look better. I'm going to add some transparent earth orange to this and go up to the eye socket. And I'm really just going to spread all this all around. Just darken up that whole area. Fill in any of those spaces. And get a nice even tone there. I'll probably even bring some alizarin permanent into that. Just to get that cool red going. And you know, you don't have to do just one glazing layer. You can glaze and glaze and glaze and continue to do it. Now, I want to do this side of the nose. I want to darken it up a bit, but not too much. So where do I need to go? It's got the right color. I like, I like the color. I like, the, well, I like the value. I like the hue. I like everything about that. It needs to kind of come out a bit more. So let's, let's try this darkest dark that we mixed up. And I'm going to keep it really thin. And I'm just going to pull it all over the top. I'm checking for any kind of drawing mistakes as well. See if I can fix those up. Yeah, that, that definitely darkened it up left some of those little spots of lights coming through because I, I worked so thin with that glazing layer. So I'll probably have to come back with some thicker paint to really, um, 
you know, darken up those layers. So I think what I'll do is I'll do that. So I'm going to mix up some paint with a little bit of white in it because this is going to uh, make the paint just a bit more opaque. So in this instance, I need to get that the value correct and the hue correct. There you go. And I'm really just focusing on the little parts where the canvas is showing through. And normally what I would do in this instance is I would say, oh, okay, well, this, this is going to be the enhancement glaze. And I'll wait till this glaze is dry and then go in with another glaze, a second glazing layer, fill in a lot of those spaces and enhance even further. And the more you do it, this, the richness of texture and depth within the painting just, just increases and increases. It's a lot of fun. I'm gonna go over here and mix up, kind of getting into a lighter skin tone on this side. Yeah. And then you can do some fun things. So let me pop into that really red color. So right here, darken it up with my darkest dark. So we have this really rich, dark red color here as my kitten is screaming at the door. And I'm going to put it here. It's going to darken this up, but bring in a rich tone that I want a little bit more red. Yeah, I like that. Really livened up that color a lot. And then I'll put it, I'll make it a bit darker. Lizard permanent. And move that bright, that intense color over to the other side, kind of spread it around, keep it even, keep it balanced. Right in there. Yeah, that's looking pretty darn good. Nice. Okay. Now let's go back to my designated lighting light brush where a lot of light tones we'll be working with. And let's get into the lighter areas. Now, technically, if you're using white to glaze with, they call it scumbling. So if you're using a lot of white, you would call it scumbling. I try not to use a ton of white in these layers, but this is so light that I really need to bring some white into it. But I also want to bring a lot of color into this as well. So we're going to add in a lot of transparent earth orange, a lot of my red to make it as pink as I can. And this is fairly intense right here. I'm going to add some medium to get it as transparent as I can get it. Ooh, let's bring it over there. That's intense as well. And I'm going to keep it intense, fairly intense color. Let's see what this does. Well, maybe it's not as intense as I put my brush up to the canvas. Yeah, it's not too bad. That's pretty good. I think, I think I can up the intensity, honestly. Let's dip into this transparent earth red and bring some of that in here. It's not going to be as intense as my Napthal Scarlet, but it's going to bring some intensity. And you don't have to make things look exactly like it looks on your reference. This is where artistry comes in. So I'm going to jump into some alizarin permanent because I'm seeing more of these cooler reds. Ooh, that's really intense. Let's go with it. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's bring it all the way up. 
really give this half tone some life. Let's uh, bring a warmer red into everything, like this kind of pink as well, because I'm seeing some pinks happening over here at the edge of the nose. And right as this turns, you know, you get right at the Terminator, you'll see these really intense um, colors, colors that have a lot of intensity to them. It's not everywhere, but when you can see those and put them down bravely, it just enhances. And so I put down a color here that's too dark. I'm just gonna clean off my brush and kind of just move it around, just spread it around so it's more influenced by the colors behind it. So that it kind of darkens up that area, but doesn't take it over. Let's go back over here into these kind of pinkish, orange, intense colors that I got. And what I'm trying to do here, because I saw this with, um, you know, living with this painting for a few days, is my highlight isn't isn't light enough. And I could just put white in the highlight, but that would kind of deaden things out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna darken up everything around the highlight. And then that will help the highlight stand out on its own. Because once you, once you go into that, you know, greatest threshold of titanium white, you have nowhere to go after that. But if you use the relative values of all of the other spaces within your painting and maybe compress those values down, what you can do is uh, kind of broaden your ability. You have more range at that point. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. I see a sharper edge right up here of lighter tone. Not that light though. Let's bring it back down. That is definitely a scumble there. You can really tell when you got too much white because it will, um, it'll be kind of like a haze over the color that was below. And what we want to do is enhance. We don't want to create this kind of white haze over things. Unless you're dealing with atmosphere perspective, then glazing with white would do really well, but we don't have any aspect. This is not a landscape. We're not doing atmospheric perspective, so. Yeah, and probably what I'll do is I'll jump back into my dark brush here. And on that edge, you see, I went over this darker area with my lighter tone. It looks, it kind of deadened it. I didn't, I don't really like that. It looks a bit dead. That's where that um, scumbling kind of idea comes in with too much white. So I'm going to use a more intense, darker color to bring that back. But I also want to have a slight fade there as a, a softer edge. And then I'm gonna stick with this brush because what I see is this needs to soften out as well. All on this side. Nice, 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 nice. I'm liking this, this is my favorite part just doing the glazing and enhancing. It's like all the heavy lifting has been done, the drawing's done, the rel like all the values are in place, all of the hues are in place. I got the intensity kind of dialed in the way I want it um, to the, for the most part, you know, on all these uh, aspects of color. And now it's just all about enhancement and trying to uh, make things really just stand out. It's a lot of fun. This is the fun part. Definitely. And then I'm going to go ahead and darken up that little stripe.
All right, back to my lighter brush. I'm going to add a bit of a darker glaze over here. I want some more intensity in that though. Transparent earth red will help with that. This is a fun thing about glazing. So I'll put this kind of line in, right? And with no intention of keeping it that way. I, I can even draw lines up here, right? So it's kind of like a color, like I've established a color in a, in a place. And now I'm just gonna kind of wipe out my brush with a, the, the paper towel a bit. And then I'm just gonna take this dry brush and move that paint around, especially on the edge here. And just subtly kind of blend all that into what is the background that's already established. Very subtle, very fantastic, very easy to do. Love it. I'm going to get my darker brush out because I see that I need to bring this dark area further up onto the nostril just a little bit and then go back into my lighter area and do a little bit of blending on this side of that shadow shape. Probably knock down that intensity of that red a little bit as well. here needs some definition to it indicating the turn of the nose to the dark side poor nose going to the dark side or at least this shadow is sorry it was a bad star wars joke Yeah, that's looking fantastic. Okay, the piece de resistance would be adding those highlights in. They're not gonna be pure white, but they're gonna be pretty close to it. I'm gonna add some of this kind of uh, red color into it that I have mixed up. Oof, maybe a bit more white, a bit more opaque. What is the angle of those highlights? Gonna get that in, describing the form in the highlights. It's where texture is shown most is within the highlights. Look at an orange, you'll see right in the highlights, the texture of the skin. And that's the same with uh, humans as well. You'll see the texture of the skin with um, the texture of the highlights it describes everything really, really well. I can take this into there. All these really subtle changes I'm making so easily. I'll probably jump into my dark brush. And then I, I just want to fade out that edge there just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a break because I think I'm done with this layer. <clears throat> this last layer of our front view nose. And as I step back and look, I'm going to determine if I need to take it further or if I need to go on to my next nose. Okay. So I stood back to the painting, looked at the nose, look at the nose that I wrought and I decided it's good. Looks good. I'm like, I like where it's at. It, that took no time. I think uh, it went so quickly because 
I really had a nice structure of paint and drawing and value and color and everything down. It just made that glazing layer so much easier. What's great about this kind of method, within two or three days, that, would, that glazing layer would be completely dry on the nose and I could do another glazing layer if I wanted to smooth out all of the edges. So if I wanted to get even smoother texture, I could do that with more and more glazing layers. So it would smooth thing, everything over, but the subtlety of those little value changes and things within the paint would still show through and the enhancement of, of the drawing or the painting itself would be uh, even more fantastic, I think. So you can do that. You can continue working those glazing layers, um, you know, at infinitum, really. Just keep on adding more oil to your, your paint mixtures. And that's what, how you do it. Congratulations on making it to the end of this incredibly long, comprehensive video tutorial. Now it's time to take it to the next level. The complete tutorial is packed with even more tips and tricks and techniques for painting with individuality and character. So you can continue on with hours more of high quality video content as I paint the other two noses. So see the link in the description below. And if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm here to help you become a better artistic version of yourself. So have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for watching.